Hey guys, it's Mr. Kleiman here. Wait, are you in your pajamas? Have some self-respect, get out of bed, get yourself dressed, feel good, let's get some work done. Folks, welcome to week one. I'm going to do my very best to do an instructional video for you, working you through everything you need to know for cellular respiration. I'm going to say a lot of details, but let's just get to the overall picture. Here we go. Let's dive in. Cellular respiration. That thing right in the middle is the mitochondria right here. And what we're going to look at today is how can a cell extract energy from glucose using this guy. So quick recap of where we left off before the March break. We were talking about the laws of thermodynamics and we said that these are really important for biologists to think about. We said that energy can't be created or destroyed. And for a biologist, what that means is that every bit of energy that you have and use has got to come from somewhere. It can't come from nowhere. So some creatures are autotrophs. The most common types are photosynthetic ones. And what they do is they take energy from the sun directly. You and I are heterotrophs, and that means that we need to get our energy from food. And of course, that food, at some point down a food chain, comes back down to photosynthesis. In other words, all of that energy comes from the sun, gets trapped into some living thing, and can eventually get passed on to you. But the second law of thermodynamics makes this problematic for life, because every time you transfer energy from one form or one material into another, you're going to lose some to the environment. And so the universe is going to tend towards what we call chaos. Things are going to get more and more disorganized over time. But that begged the question of why are we, as living things, so incredibly organized? And the basic answer is, it's temporary. Sorry, folks, the organization of all of the atoms and molecules in your body is a very temporary state of that matter, and you need a constant source of incoming energy just to stay alive. And so we summarize that uh, with this diagram here. We said when energy goes from the sun into, let's say, glucose, we lose some energy there. To turn glucose into ATP, we lose some more energy there. And then all day, every day, you're using more and more ATP. And that's generating a lot of energy in the form of heat. And you're releasing some of that energy that was stored. And so we are warm-blooded creatures. And like you can see uh, in this guy who is videoed with, or whose uh, picture was taken with a thermal camera, he's emitting some of that heat. He is contributing to the chaos of the universe. And so are you. And so all we can really do to temporarily organize our molecules and to temporarily organize energy into forms that are useful for living things is that we need to use these coupled reactions. Trap energy into one molecule. Okay, maybe we've got some reactant here. Okay, and then we can use that energy Okay, or we can release, I should say, some of that energy in a chemical reaction and then have another chemical reaction right next door that can absorb not all of it, but some of it. And we're going to get that second product. So ultimately, what living things are trying to do is make this reaction happen. And they're going to get the energy to make that reaction happen by coupling it, usually with the use of ATP. When we're using ATP, what we're really doing is a coupled reaction. We start out with that molecule of ATP, and then uh, we break off a phosphate from the molecule, leaving us with ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and this inorganic phosphate molecule. And it's the energy released in this reaction that's going to allow this reaction, the one we want, to proceed. If this is our molecule of ATP, we can break off a phosphate which is going to release some of the energy stored in that molecule and an inorganic phosphate. The remaining molecule is called adenosine diphosphate, and that reaction gives off about 31 kilojoules per mole. And that doesn't seem like a lot, but it's enough to get a very small reaction going, let's say at the level of a cell membrane or at the level of an enzyme substrate complex. And so we can't use glucose directly because glucose uh, would give off if we broke down all of the high energy bonds in it about 2,805 kilojoules per mole uh, when we completely and totally uh, 
uh, burn it or oxidize it using it for energy. And so here you can see whew, some sugar uh, being placed into some potassium chlorate and all at once all of the solar energy that's been stored inside of those glucose molecules is getting released at the same time. You are seeing the release of sunlight. Okay, when I think of glucose, I think of it like a solar battery. It's all of this stored up solar energy that was put in there by photosynthesis, which is gonna be the topic of our next metabolic process that we're gonna study. For now, let's just talk about how to get all that energy back out of there without blowing up like you just saw. Okay, so ATP is this reusable molecule where we can break off little bits at a time and use those little bits of energy in coupled reactions. So how do we make that ATP? Well, these are the main organelles that are going to do it. Chloroplasts can do it, that's the green guy over there, and mitochondria can do it as well. Both of them are going to create concentration gradients of H plus ions, or protons for short. Kind of like this dam. You can build up a high concentration on one side of the dam and let it flow along its natural gravitational gradient. Okay, for water, this is from high to low to eventually turn a turbine. We can't use gravity inside of a cell, but we can use concentration gradients. Store up a bunch of H plus on one side and let it flow through the membrane through a particular protein called ATP synthase. And as it bends and turns and warps, it's generating ATP. That's those little pink things you see flying out the bottom. Pretty cool. So here you can see what it might look like if you could see the inside of uh, mitochondria and you're looking at that inner membrane of the mitochondria. There's all of these ATP synthase proteins embedded into that membrane churning away um, using that proton gradient to generate more and more ATP. And those big green globs you can see there we're going to get to in a minute, but those are the pumps that are being used to get uh, those protons to build up a high concentration. We'll revisit them in a bit. Before we can really dive into how this works, we need a little bit of chemistry background. You might have learned about redox reactions. Um, remember we learned the uh, acronym oil rig earlier on. Uh, before the March break, so you can remember what oxidation and reduction mean. Oil, O-I-L, means oxidation is losing. Anything that is oxidized means that it is losing electrons. And RIG, R-I-G, means that anything being reduced, reduction is gaining. Okay, so anything that's been reduced is gaining electrons. And what we can do in order to transfer energy from one place to another is transfer it in the form of electrons. We want things to get reduced. When they get reduced, they grab that energy. They hold on to it in the form of some extra electrons. When we want to release that energy again, we oxidize. And so you might have heard that you will oxidize uh, your food. And that's what, what metabolism is really doing. You're oxidizing it, which means you're releasing energy from your food. In biology, we think of oxidation and reduction slightly differently. That first molecule there, methane, is an organic compound. And when you react it with oxygen, okay, to form something like, let's say, carbon dioxide rather than methane, when you're bonding carbon to oxygen, those oxygen atoms have a stronger pull for electrons than carbon. And so while it's not being completely uh, oxidized, that carbon atom is oxidized enough, the electrons are pulled away from it enough that it actually does release a fair amount of energy. Okay, and you can see that those oxygen atoms, uh, when they're bonded now to water uh, in that chemical reaction, that combustion reaction of burning, right? Methane plus oxygen would be burning. Um, that oxygen is now holding those electrons a little bit closer. And so when the electrons shift closer to oxygen, we say that it's been reduced. The bottom line here is, is that what I'm saying is every time we break off a carbon atom from an organic compound by adding oxygen to that carbon, right, forming CO2, that's what you're breathing out, 
the formation of carbon dioxide is oxidizing your organic compounds, and that's the maximum degree of oxidation that they can get is to be in the form of CO2, which means that they've released as much energy as they're going to release. So that's how we're going to extract energy from our food, is by oxidizing all of those carbon atoms. So here you can see varying degrees of molecules being uh, oxidized until they reach their most oxidized form uh, of CO2. Uh, some other really important molecules that are going to help us understand cellular respiration are this one right here. And if you look really closely at it, this whole big honking thing uh, is really just two ATPs stuck together. I mean, not exactly perfectly, but it's really basically an adenine, a ribose sugar, and a phosphate linked to another phosphate, a uh, ribose sugar, and another adenine group. Um, what's really cool about this molecule is that it very readily accepts two extra electrons. Okay, so it can be reduced, and we can go from this NAD with a positive charge form, and there's our little positive charge in the molecule right there, and with just a little shuffle of adding in two electrons into those two spots, we end up with this guy right here, which we call NADH. And there's the extra H that goes with it. In order to gain those two electrons, a proton comes with it. NADH, uh, sorry, NAD plus is the oxidized form. Well, NADH is the reduced form of this molecule. And what it's really good for is to bring energy from one place to another. Pick up some electrons from a reaction over here, enter into the form of NADH, and I can bring it somewhere else. In the case of cellular respiration, it's going to bring it to the mitochondria's inner membrane, where we can actually use that energy and those electrons to generate ATP. I'll pay quick lip service to this one, but this is yet another one of these molecules uh, that has two forms, an oxidized and a reduced form. We call it another high energy carrier. And so there's where you can see uh, it's taken on some extra electrons. There's an extra pair of electrons right there, that new double bond. Uh, in order to do that, it takes in two protons uh, and we get FADH2. I guess I'll go back to that for one quick second. FAD is the oxidized form and FADH2 is its reduced form. So we can carry around energy throughout cells in the form of ATP, in the form of NADH, and in the form of FADH2. All of those are carrying extra high energy electrons that we can use for all kinds of cool things. So here's the goal of what we're about to look at for cellular respiration. Uh, when you saw that little gummy burning, what we did is got over the activation energy barrier by heating it up, and then all at once all of that energy was released and you saw that in the form of an enormous and incredibly hot flame. We can't get energy out of sugars in this way, we would explode. What we want to do is to do little itty bitty reactions, each with a smaller activation energy, and each time we do that, couple that with another reaction and try to trap some of that energy. Maybe transfer some high energy electrons, maybe grab some of that heat. But each one of these little itty bitty steps that you see me tracing is an enzyme mediated process. So the main difference between burning sugar in a fire, which would be just adding it to oxygen directly in a chemical reaction, and then burning sugar as calories for food, is that when you're burning sugars for calorie for food, you're doing it in a cell in many, many, many different steps. And each of those little tiny steps is an enzyme mediated process, not one giant crazy reaction all at once. Okay, so this is how burning and cellular respiration are similar, but a little bit different as well. So what is this thing, cellular respiration? Well, firstly, it's aerobic. It is going to be combining oxygen with our food, right, to oxidize it, to release its energy. And we're going to use the chemical energy that gets uh, released in order to convert that glucose into ATP. We're going to trap that energy and we're going to use it to turn that turbine of ATP synthase. Uh, we've got one glucose that is going to produce about 36 to 38 ATP. That's a lot, a lot, a lot of ATP. Uh, the chemical energy stored in ATP can then be used to power other reactions through coupling. So here's the outline of what's about to happen. Uh, when sugar goes into your cells uh, in just the cytoplasm, 
Okay, it says cytosol here, interchangeable with the, with the word cytoplasm. Before it even gets to the mitochondria, you can partially break it down and get some energy out of it. You don't even need mitochondria. Okay, we call that process glycolysis. Um, the end product of glycolysis, pyruvate, can then be fed into the next step that happens inside the mitochondria. We only get a very small amount of ATP from this process, but we're going to get a huge payoff of ATP from these two processes down here that are happening inside of the mitochondria. So first step is to get pyruvate inside the mitochondria through pyruvate oxidation. And then the second step is to continue to break down that pyruvate molecule until it's finally all just CO2, and that process we call the Krebs cycle. Once it's all broken down, we don't quite have a lot of ATP yet, but we're going to make a lot of NADH and FADH2. And we can feed those into the last step, which is called the electron transport chain, which is really just a fancy way of saying uh, feeding it to some enzymes waiting in the inner mitochondrial matrix. And that's where we've got these little turbines that are going to um, make ATP. These are really important words that you're going to read about and that you're going to think about and that need to become part of your vocabulary. Let's make sure they're crystal clear. A substrate level phosphorylation is when the ATP is made directly by an enzyme rather than relying on that turbine of ATP synthase to make the ATP. Okay, Oxidative decarboxylation is a fancy way of saying uh, getting CO2 out and coupling that with some kind of a redox reaction where we can trap the energy in released uh, in the form of high energy electrons. So oxidize and trap some energy in a redox reaction. And then the last one is called oxidative phosphorylation, which really is just a fancy word to describe the chemical reactions that are taking place in the electron transport chain. So here's the overall reaction for cellular respiration. We're going to take glucose, combine it with oxygen, and as you know, we're going to release CO2, carbon dioxide, and of course that end product, water. Uh, and the entire purpose of this is that we're also going to be releasing that energy from glucose, hopefully trapping most of it, but some of it's going to be released as heat. So there's the chemistry of it for the chemists in the room. Let's keep going. Okay, this is the molecule that we're going to start with. So let's dive into our first process, which is breaking down that glucose uh, in a process called glycolysis. Now you can see I've written glycolysis 1 at the top of the screen. We can break down glycolysis in our minds into two steps, the investment period and the payoff. We're going to need to use a bit of ATP to get this thing started. Think of it kind of like activation energy, uh, but it's going to be multi-step. Okay, we need to invest some ATP in order to get a whole bunch out. Okay, we're going to invest less than we're going to get back out. So we call this the investment period. We're going to use ATP to kind of activate that glucose, and then we're going to pop out um, some ATP at the end. Uh, let's have a look at the process. We're going to need to track those carbon atoms uh, within the glucose molecule so that we can correctly name all of our compounds. Okay, so here's our glucose molecule, and we'll go clockwise, and there's carbons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. We're going to use those same numbers uh, when we're looking at my simplified pictures of a glucose molecule throughout. Please note that I've removed all of the hydroxyl groups just for simplicity's sake. Um, I'm not going to expect you uh, to know the full chemical structure of any of these intermediates. So here's glucose. Enters into the cytoplasm of a cell. And right away, there are enzymes waiting for it that can use ATP to get this thing prepared. I'm not going to show the enzymes or name the enzymes. Just know that every reaction arrow you see there is going to represent an enzyme-mediated process. And so there you've got an ATP, and we're going to use it to phosphorylate glucose uh, on carbon-6. And so we're going to call this glucose-6-phosphate. Okay, We're still not quite ready once it has taken on that extra phosphate, we use another enzyme to convert glucose 6-phosphate into fructose 6-phosphate. Right? This is just an isomerization. This is rearranging the atoms, but not adding or taking any away. Just a little rearrangement. And then we add a second ATP. 
and we end up with this molecule with a bizarre name called fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Don't ask me why it's bis and not bi. Who knows? Uh, and finally, that thing is going to immediately uh, break down on its own into two molecules of what we call G3P or glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate. Uh, I'm skipping a step there and there's some enzymes involved, but for simplicity's sake, that's good enough for me. So that's our investment. Okay, we've used two ATP so far and we've gotten nothing out. That sucks. Let's get some stuff out in glycolysis too. We call this the payoff period. And what we're going to get out is a little bit of ATP directly, and we're also going to start making some other high energy molecules. In particular, we're going to make some NADH. Let's have a look at how it goes. So we've got now two molecules of G3P that we've made from our glucose. And the next step, still occurring in the cytoplasm, is that we've got another enzyme that can take NAD+, the oxidized form of NADH, and an inorganic phosphate, right, just a PO4, 3 minus, that's floating around in the cytoplasm, can take both of those ingredients and add them into the mix. The phosphate is going to get directly added to that G3P. But the NAD plus is going to be involved in a coupled reaction. It's not going to bond directly to this carbon-based molecule. Instead, what it's going to do is pick up some high-energy electrons. And when it does that, now it's carrying some of the energy from that G3P. We're starting to extract little bits and hold on to it. Okay, we can now get some ATP back out. Now we're starting with ADP. This is a used up ATP floating around in the cytoplasm. And we can now, boom, start getting our phosphates back and putting them back onto ATP, resetting them. Okay, we're taking out some energy little bits at a time. Here's a dehydration reaction that takes place to get it ready for the next step. And boom, we can do it again. Okay, this process is going to happen over and over again as more and more glucose molecules uh, enter into the cell. And by the end of that process, we've now got four ATP that we've made and two NADH molecules, these other high energy molecules that are useful. And all we had to pay was two ATP to get it started. Okay. Notice as well that the final product that we've made is this three carbon molecule of pyruvate, Glucose was a six carbon molecule, and now we have two three carbon molecules uh, at the end of glycolysis. So there it is in summary, and this is right from your textbook. You've got glycolysis one, which is the investment phase. We put two ATP in, and we get none out. In glycolysis two, we end up getting back our four ATP and these two additional NADH2 molecules. So overall, our net gain is that we've gained two ATP from each glucose and two NADH, right? Invested two, got four. Overall, that's two ATP in the end. So remember, we said that we're going to make a lot more uh, ATP than just two. We're going to make between 36 and 38. Oh, typo in my slide. Uh, but between 36 and 38 ATP from a single molecule of glucose. And that's why we developed these, uh, this partnership with what used to be a prokaryotic cell and is now an organelle. You developed a partnership with mitochondria because they are exceptionally good at taking pyruvate and continuing to process it much, much further and get way more energy out of it through oxidative decarboxylations. We're going to get to really extract some energy through redox reactions. Okay, so two ATP made in the cytoplasm from glycolysis, and we're about to make woo, a heck of a lot more inside the mitochondria. Hey everybody, I'm just going to interrupt myself for a quick moment to say this is a great time to pause the video and go to your textbook. Read chapter four, uh, up to page 173, and that'll get you well set up for your first assignment, which is going to be to create a simplified diagram of all of the steps of glycolysis with a few key annotations. Check out the assignment on our Google Classroom, and when you're done, jump back into the video and continue on for the remainder of the week. Yeah.
So this is really where most of the work of cellular respiration is going to take place. So let's quickly learn a little bit about the parts of the mitochondria. Uh, there's a little jelly bean uh, organelle there. There's its outer membrane, and it has an inner membrane as well that's highly folded to have a really big surface area. Anytime you see anything really highly folded like that, think surface area. Uh, there's something that must be going on on that membrane that's really important, and that's actually where the electron transport chain is that's making pretty much all of the ATP. Uh, the inner inner fluid in the very center of this, uh, we call it the mitochondrial matrix, and then we have this other fluid that's between the membranes, it's called the intermembrane space, and it's in that intermembrane space where we're going to generate that proton gradient. We're going to build up H plus ions in this space, and we're going to let them flow back through that inner membrane through a turbine to make ATP. Okay, It's going to go pump it out, let it flow back in, pump it out, let it flow back in, and we're going to use that to make ATP. Okay, each one of these little folds in the membrane are called, well, one is a crista, and many are called cristae. And so when you see me zoom in on diagrams, uh, I might start talking about the cristae, which are just the fold, the inner folds of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Um, there is where um, we're going to do most of the breaking down of the pyruvate molecule in a process called the Krebs cycle. And there's where the electron transport chain is that's going to generate the ATP. Okay, so there's our proton gradient that we're going to build up. It's going to be generated in the intermembrane space. And we're going to use it to make some ATP. So here's sort of a more three-dimensional picture so you can get a sense of what the mitochondria might look like if you sliced it open. And here's what it looks like under the electron microscope. You can see that huge surface area and all those little folds everywhere. These are the cristae. Okay, so let's zoom in. Right now we've got in the cytoplasm surrounding the mitochondria this really useful molecule of pyruvate. Without mitochondria, it's done. We can't do anything with this. We can't get any more energy out of it. But in reality, there's a tremendous amount of energy left. Look how many hydrogens are still attached to this guy. It's not even close to fully oxidized yet. We can still get three carbons out of it and turn them each into CO2. It's a lot more oxidation that we can do. So how are we going to do it? we got to get it inside the mitochondria. And to do that, we've got a really complicated protein that's going to help get it in. And that protein uh, simply allows us to get it into the inner mitochondrial matrix. Waiting for it in there is what we call a multi-enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which is a fancy way to say that there's a tremendously complicated group of enzymes with quaternary structure all stuck together that can all do these jobs simultaneously to do the Krebs cycle incredibly fast and efficiently. They're going to break that thing down in no time flat. Okay, as soon as it gets in there, the first thing that happens uh, is a decarboxylation, which is a fancy way of saying we're going to break off one of those carbon atoms and um, uh, release it as a CO2. Please note that it started out as a carboxyl group. It already had both oxygens. We haven't added any yet. So there's our oxidative decarboxylation. And when I say that it's oxidative, I mean we're going to couple that with the production of a high energy molecule through a redox reaction. NAD plus is going to come in at the same time as that decarboxylation uh, and it's going to make NADH. Last thing we're going to do to get it ready for the Krebs cycle is we're going to attach it to coenzyme A. And that's just something that we need in order for the reactions of the Krebs cycle to begin. So now that it's inside the mitochondria and we've already started making even more NADH, uh, we can get to work on breaking down those last two carbons. So here they come. Okay, they're entering now the, the Krebs cycle as what we call acetyl CoA. Notice it's now just a two carbon compound. So there's a little summary of what we just saw. We're releasing CO2. At the same time, we're coupling that reaction of the production of NADH. Together, this is called an oxidative decarboxylation. From each glucose, we've made two pyruvates, which means that from each glucose molecule, we've now made two CO2 molecules and two NADHs from this process. Don't forget as well, we've already made two NADH uh, in the cytoplasm from glycolysis and a couple of ATP.
So here's the reactions that are happening inside the mitochondria. Again, we call them the Krebs cycle. Many sources will also call it the citric acid cycle, and that's indicative of the fact that it enters into the Krebs cycle as citrate, which is also called citric acid. It's the stuff that also makes uh, the flavor of all those citrus fruits that you're familiar with. Uh, so look, there's a lot of stuff that's happening in this diagram, but the bottom line is what we're going to do is break off these two CO2s in oxidative decarboxylations. And so there's pyruvate oxidation, what we just saw, that's coming into the mitochondria, and now here's the Krebs cycle. Let's see how we get the rest of the energy out. Okay, those are the two CO2s we're going to release, and we do it almost right away. Acetyl-CoA turns into citrate, which gets isomerized into isocitrate, and now we can start uh, our oxidative decarboxylations, and there they are. Okay, uh, each one of those is going to generate an NADH, right? These are oxidative decarboxylations. Uh, that's going to happen one, two, and then a third time we're going to get that to happen, but without the decarboxylation. So why is that happening here? Well, there's so much energy released from these two reactions that it creates like a cascade of other reactions that follow immediately. Remember, this whole thing is a big complex of proteins that are all right there in that same spot, and they can grab that energy all at once, boom, 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 make a chain reaction of more uh, breakdown occur and create even more high energy, energy um uh, final products. So here you can see we're going to make one, two, and then yet another one, a third NADH later on. Uh, we're also going to generate that other high energy molecule, FADH2, in another coupled reaction. And you can see there's even a little bit of ATP being made directly down there. So for every turn of the Krebs cycle, we're going to get those last two uh, carbons released from pyruvate. One was released in pyruvate oxidation. The other two were released in the Krebs cycle. That glucose is completely gone. And what do we get back? We end up with three molecules of NADH, one molecule of FADH2, and one molecule of ATP per pyruvate. Don't forget, two pyruvate per glucose. Let's double the numbers. So we've released two CO2s in oxidative decarboxylation and four more here that's the six carbons that were in that glucose molecule in the first place we're done so it's fully broken down and let's make a tally of what we've made we started with one glucose we made two pyruvates that were three carbons each and when we did that during glycolysis we got two atp and two nadh2s we continued that now in the mitochondria and ended up with six co2s that glucose is completely gone and fully oxidized and as a result, what do we get out of it? Well, we got two more ATP directly made in the Krebs cycle. We got two more NADH that were made in pyruvate oxidation. And then we got six more NADH made in the Krebs cycle. That's a grand total of 10. And we also made those two FADH2 molecules as well. So you can see what we've really made is a bunch of high energy molecules, mostly NADH and FADH2. So there it is, a nice little summary table. I've included a bunch of these for you. Read them and think about them. And where are we going to feed them into? We're going to feed them into what's called the electron transport chain. This is what we're going to use those high energy molecules for. Okay. Um, this picture is trying to represent the inner mitochondrial matrix, right? Those cristae that we were talking about. And embedded all throughout that membrane are a series of uh, protein complexes. Each one of these globs that I've made doesn't represent a single protein. It's uh, got quaternary structure. This is a complex of many, many proteins all together. Uh, it's a pretty incredible space. Uh, but for the most part, uh, you're seeing uh, three out of the four of those complexes uh, that exist just for simplicity's sake. So this is complex one, three, and four. Complex two, um, I'll, I'll revisit uh, at the end. But basically, these are going to take the high energy molecules, take out those high energy electrons. In other words, it's going to oxidize them and use the energy now to create a proton gradient. They, these are little protons. Uh, proton pumps is really what they are. That's what I want you to think of them as. These complexes are proton pumps. And once they create a high concentration of H plus here, 
we can let them flow out here. Okay, and this of course represents ATP synthase, uh, that super cool uh, turbine. So here we have one of our high energy molecules. I'm going to start with an, a molecule of NADH. This is now inside the mitochondria. Uh, that's in the mitochondrial matrix. And when it bumps into that inner membrane, it's going to get oxidized. And when it gives up those high energy electrons to complex one, complex one is going to use some of the energy in those electrons to pump to protons. But there's more energy in them yet. And so they get passed on through another series of redox reactions to a bunch of intermediates until they get to complex three and then complex four. And so if you do that tally, let's watch it again. Oops. Let's watch it again. We're going to pump two and then four and then six protons across the membrane. And now you can clearly see that concentration gradient, right? Lots of protons here, not a lot there. They wanna come back, but this membrane is impermeable to them. The only way that they can come back is through the turbine, okay? This is like that dam that you saw earlier uh, in the presentation. So now we've got an interesting problem because this complex, number four, is reduced, which means that it's got these high energy electrons that are now low energy. They've been all used up. And so it can't be reduced again. It's already in its reduced form. We need some way of clearing out these used up low energy electrons out of the system. And this is the first and last time that oxygen is finally going to come into play. And it'll be in a reaction that I'm skimming over with this animation, but uh, a reaction where we call it the final electron acceptor. It'll be involved in a redox reaction that ultimately produces water. And this is the main place where water is, in fact, a final product of the process of cellular respiration. Now the trap is reset and another NADH can feed back into that process. I didn't animate it here for you just in the interest of time. Um, but where complex two comes into play is that it kind of fits maybe over here in my picture. And if I was showing you FADH2, it would skip the first pump and it will make a little bit less of a proton gradient. Uh, it pumps a bit fewer. So NADH makes uh, one extra ATP and FADH2 makes one less. So here it goes. Okay, we're using now ATP synthase and for every two protons that go through it, we get one ATP. That number is uh, still up for a little bit of debate and there's interesting research going on to confirm that that number is actually accurate. But for the most part, we can more or less trust that it's about two protons per ATP when you spin that turbine. So really that's what's going on here, right? It's a protein um, a quaternary structure molecule doing this crazy work of making ATP from a proton gradient. So here's a picture uh, from your textbook that includes all of the complexes. There's complex one, and there's two, and three, and four. And here you can see FADH2 is being pumped, uh, is being fed in, is feeding in its electrons uh, essentially to complex two. Uh, really, it's feeding them into here, but simplicity's sake, it's skipping the first pump. Whereas NADH is using all three pumps. Okay, so if we do the tally, we're going to pump two, four, six protons for every NADH. That's going to make three ATP. For every FADH2, we're only going to pump two, four, and end up with two ATP uh, per FADH2. And so here we go. Let's summarize these things in a table. Before the electron transport chain, we had this, which was mostly just a bunch of high energy molecules. For each one of these NADH molecules, we can make three ATP. And for each one of these FADH2 molecules, we can make two ATP. So let's do the math. This table is summarizing what's happening just in the electron transport chain. And this is where my calculation is slightly different from that of the textbook. The two NADH that were made in the cytoplasm, I'm going to say that we don't get a full three ATP from each one because it let's say costs one ATP to get it into the mitochondria. 
It's not exactly true, but I think it's a useful way to think about it, that the efficiencies are um, not perfect here. So I'm going to factor in a little bit of uncertainty by saying that each of these two NADHs that were made in the cytoplasm are only going to make two ATP each in the electron transport chain. So two times two, that's a total of four. The rest of the high energy molecules are made directly inside of the mitochondria and there's now no cost to get them in. So 2NADH, each one makes 3 ATP in the electron transport chain and that results in 6 more ATP. In Krebs cycle we've got 6NADH plus 2NADH2 being produced uh, and if you do the math that's another 22 ATP. Add them all up, that's a grand total of just 32. But don't forget, we also have made a little bit more because in glycolysis, we made two ATP directly. And also in the Krebs cycle, we made two ATP directly. And so if we add all of that together, we get 36 ATP. If you don't factor in that little inefficiency, that would be two more still, which would get you to 38, which is the number that you see in your textbook. And so let's look at the overall reaction of cellular respiration. We started with one molecule of glucose. We ended up with six molecules of carbon dioxide. In that process of oxidizing our molecule of glucose, we released a bunch of energy that we trapped mostly in these redox reactions to take NAD plus and FAD and turn them into their reduced form of NADH and FADH2. Now these were just temporary carriers of high energy electrons because when we use them in the electron transport chain, they gave up those high energy electrons, got oxidized and went back to their original oxidized form. So you can think of them kind of like catalysts in this reaction rather than actually reactants or products, just temporary carriers of some of the energy that's being transferred from one molecule to another. Uh, so let's put them in a little box, put them aside from the chemical reaction and say that they were helping us to extract some usable energy from the oxidation of glucose in the form of 36 to 38 ATP. Uh, don't forget that in order to keep the electron transport chain going, we need that final electron acceptor, we needed oxygen. And when uh, oxygen was reduced and accepted those extra electrons, it was involved in a reaction that produces water. And so if we summarize all that together, here's our reactants, glucose plus oxygen, and here's our final products, carbon dioxide and water, and we've got, now got usable energy in the form of ATP. And ladies and gentlemen, that is cellular respiration. So ladies and gents, there's a lot more to that unit. Um, that's the abridged version for you, but the rest of it is now unfortunately under quarantine. So that's uh, it. Please check in with the instructions for your assignment for the week. I hope you found that helpful. I've put links to other uh, online lessons uh, made by other people that are probably better than mine, but I thought you might like to see me and my resources. Don't forget that I've got all my resources on my website as well, but please, they're 100% optional. The only things I'm requiring uh, for this week is what I've posted for you in the Google Classroom. I miss you guys. Uh, hope that helps. Working hard on this end, and I hope that you work hard on yours. Thanks so much, everyone.